Hi, my name is Mark and welcome to The Active Listener, where we aim to listen, not just hear. We firmly believe that everyone has an interesting story to tell, if given the space to do so. So listen in to what our guests have to say. You may learn something. I guess I had a fairly normal kind of childhood, but then I got into martial arts when I was pretty young. And I, through that means, I got sucked into, I think, this thing called Agile. And those two things, Agile and the martial arts, have been major strands of my life uh, for most of my life. Um, I'm not not young. Uh, I'm in my 50s um, now. And I guess I got serious uh, about things um, like this, Agile and martial arts, which I, I incidentally I count as the self-same thing. They're the same subject, two different expressions of the same subject. Uh, in the early 1980s uh, and late, really late, late 1970s with the martial arts. And so that's who I am. Um, I'm happy married. I live in Cornwall. I have a wonderful family. And um, yeah, life's life's pretty good, although life's very busy. <laughs> I, I have my own business, um, which involves coaching, uh, among other things. Yeah. Firstly, why coaching? Ultimately, the question is, what is happiness? I think that short-term happiness can be achieved in a lot of different ways, and society makes a promise to people that's often broken. And that promise is you go to school, you work hard, you keep your head down, you behave well, you do what you're supposed to do, you get good grades in your exams, then you go to university, you do a sensible subject, Uh, You get a good degree, you work hard, then you go in on the milk round into a large corporation. Uh, You are squeaky clean, you're deferential to authority, you work for 40 years, as my teacher did. Uh, With Toyota, you work for 40 years and gradually you get promoted. And then you get, as time goes by, you get a better and better salary. What's the advantage to having a better and better salary? The advantage is you can buy things because you're probably pretty miserable during this process. A lot of people are miserable in their work, uh, don't enjoy their work. And this is one of the things, joys of Agile is one of the, what, what's the question that Agile's answering is, how can we make working life as much fun as outside of working life? That's one of the questions that Agile's trying to, to answer. And because people are more productive when they're happy, when they're enjoying life. But the short term is I've got some money. Maybe I've just had a promotion. I've got a or my Christmas bonus. I can go and buy myself a video recorder or something, you know, and then briefly for 10 seconds, I'm cheery. Wow, I've got a shiny new video recorder. I don't think they sell video recorders anymore. Do they? But, you, know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and then I'm happy for 10 seconds, but then the effect of that wears off again. And so I get myself some sort of hobby. And hopefully that's fulfilling and that diverts my attention from work, but it hasn't solved the root cause of the problem. How can you be happy? How can you be really fundamentally happy? I believe that long-term happiness doesn't come from a self-centered me, me, me kind of position. It doesn't come from what can I do for me today? What can I buy I get myself a nice watch and a nice car and all this kind of stuff, you know. That's not where happiness comes from. Human beings are social animals. We evolved as social animals. We are not good at things like fighting other wild animals. You imagine yourself taking on a tiger unarmed. We are good at collaboration. And we're especially good at handing knowledge down through the generations. We developed this thing we call language that enables us to do that very effectively. The wise old guy in the tribal society out in the forest or wherever it is can teach the young guys how to make this amazing piece of technology called a spear. Yeah. And we get together as a social cohesive, socially cohesive group, a small agile squad, if you like. We've all got these amazing spears. Now it's the tiger that's in trouble, not us. Right. This is what we excel at as human beings. And this is what makes us happy. You become happy through helping other people. One of the best ways to help other people is to help give them the benefit of your 
experience in life, not to tell them what to do, because people have to make their own decisions and find their own way. But what you can do is act as a bit of a guide. You can give them the advantage or the experience of the mistakes, particularly the mistakes that you've made in your life. And they can take these things into account so that hopefully they can go on and make their own mistakes and not have to repeat any of yours. That's the kind of idea. And what I've always found with coaching is coaching is a route to happiness. One of the things that makes me happy is thinking about the success that some of my students, my apprentices or whatever life I've had in their lives. That makes me very happy. I mean, for instance, in the, in the field, field of martial arts, one of my students became a European champion. Uh, that makes me feel good. Not that I'm particularly bothered about, you know, competitions mm-hmm. in martial arts. I think I, I, I stress the art side of martial arts, but the fact that that happened for him was great. And But also, I think in terms of people who started with me in the workplace, uh, you know, improving their team life in the workplace with Agile, but then that percolated out into their outside life. And, you know, and I've had some success stories with people, you know, people like long-term unemployed people, people who've fallen on hard times, people who've been in difficult circumstances, helping people in their in their whole life to, to pick themselves up and move forward in a much more positive way. And I've created a few very happy families, which I'm absolutely overjoyed about. Um, and, and this is all coaching to me. It's all the same thing. When I'm coaching people, I'm not their boss. I'm not their manager. I'm not their leader. What I am doing is I'm trying to act like a catalyst that catalyzes a, a, a movement towards a brighter, more vibrant experience of their lives. And it doesn't matter whether I'm coaching Agile in the workplace or um, shamanism or martial arts or whatever it is. Ultimately, it's about human beings coming together in productive relationships, win-win relationships. Whether I'm working with a business partner, you know, I don't, I don't. For instance, when I my business has suppliers, I don't view them as suppliers. I view them as friends, and we we collaborate together. And what I want to create, I want them to win out of the out of the relationship, and I want my business to win out of the relationship. I'm always trying to create win-win situations with people where there is not a winner and a loser. My good friend, Graham Barlow, he often says, you either win or you learn, but you don't do both. Mm. So a lot of these things are win-win situations if you approach them in the right way. You've learned, and certainly in the martial arts is true, you've learned far more through losing than you ever learned through winning. The problem with the workplace is you can't, you know, uh, do a submission on your CEO uh, when he's not thinking right, you know. Um, so, so that's one of the things why actually why I like the workplace as a as an area to test your agile stroke coaching skills, which is the same thing to me. Agile, what's what's an agile environment? An agile environment is one in which everybody is a coach. Every single member of the organization is a coach of some sort. Yeah, it's good for people who feel like they want to learn in life as a coach or as an agile practitioner. It's a great place to do it because it's so difficult, not because it's easy. How would Agile coaching, for instance, differ from other types of coaching. We hear about executive coaching, life coaching, and and so on. What what does agile coaching look like? There's sort of two levels of agile coaching. There's there's helping people to make their workplace a more vibrant, enjoyable place to work. That's what agile coaching seeks to do. So mm. I work with a lot of teams, as you know, and you, you're constantly trying to get them to view not just the work that they're doing as their baby, but also the way in which, in context and culture in which they're doing that work is also their baby. We are turning the team members themselves, metaphorically speaking, into time and motion consultants. Yep. I use a lot of analogies from the automotive industry because my teacher, Ichikato, of 25 years, was the executive vice president of Toyota and Motor Corporation in the USA, and he was managing director of Toyota in the UK. And I studied, he's my main teacher in life. I studied him for 25 years, died recently, unfortunately. Uh, wonderful guy. Uh, so that's why I use a lot of these, um, mm. these sort of analogies. But in when Henry Ford, for instance, back in the day, he, he had the, turned people into little cogs in a big wheel. Mm. He himself knew that those people were going to be miserable in those roles because he was dehumanizing them. Mm. He was turning them 
the small cogs in the big machine. But he understood the problem and he wrestled with it and he did things to try and alleviate it. He understood that they weren't happy being a, effectively a, just a cog in a machine. So he used to do things to try and cheer them up. And one of the things he used to do was wrestle his senior engineer in the middle of the Ford factory. And this really? wrestle band engineer. If you've seen pictures of Henry Ford, he's quite a slim guy. He must have been good at wrestling because um, he took this this huge muscle bound chief engineer that he had and he used to wrestle the guy to entertain his people and cheer them up <laughs> but he, he was looking for a more system systemic solution to that problem turn people into a small cog and a big wheel and then become miserable how do i keep them happy he never did come with a solution but a young man that he met um later did come up with a solution Henry Ford had hired time and motion consultants to come say, you know, the sort of guys that say, I couldn't help if you notice if you move your box of nails 10 centimeters closer to the job, you can save a tenth of a second every time you put a nail in, um, that type of thing. The time and motion consultants would sit and watch the production line and they would make recommendations to the people on the production line as to how they could improve what they were doing, mm -hmm. make themselves more productive. Henry Ford never tied those two things together in his head, but his prodigy, if you like, Tai Giono, the guy who made the miracle at Toyota after the Second World War, he did. He tied mm -hmm. those two things together. He'd seen what Ford was doing and he said, look, there's only he has the two parts of the puzzle there. He just hasn't put them together. We're not going to hire in external time and motion consultants. We're going to turn our production line workers into time and motion consultants. They are no longer just working on the work that they're doing. They're also working on the way in which they're doing that work. And mm -hmm. they're working on our organization's culture, constantly trying to improve it. And this is what you're trying to do as an agile coach at that kind of level, at the team level. But there's a more fundamental level. People say work-life balance, yeah? One of the reasons why you hear that term so much, work-life balance, is the implication is life's more fun than work, yeah? Mm. But I like to think with agile, the more fundamental level of agile is that as a life-life balance, that you make your work such an enjoyable part of your life that you personally are getting a huge amount out of it. And then the most agile organizations that I've worked in, I've certainly felt like this. In fact, the most agile organization I worked in is, is the, the just coincidentally the organization that I stayed with for the longest. I've done a huge amount of different things in my career. Ten years I stayed in this place, you know, which is a huge amount of time for me. Um, and the reason I stayed there for 10 years is I never once woke up on a Monday morning thinking, oh, no, I've got to go into work. That never happened. You know, we're having such a blast, uh, such a great time. Um, I love the people around me, love the people on my team, love my boss, still do. He's uh, Sebastian. He's one of the great characters in life. Um, and like I say, it's, it, I haven't worked for his organization since 2013. He still rings me up to this day to check, just to check I'm okay. Mm. Now that's an agile boss, right? Mm. But like a lot of these organizations, they, they would never use the word agile because they are. There's no mm -hmm. reason for them to use the term. Um, they're culturally agile. Uh, so, so at that different level, it's how can I get people's lives singing? And you can't tell people what to do. A lot of agile coaches make the mistake of going in and just telling a team what to do. You can't even do that at the team level when it's just when you're just talking about the process that they're following, you know. They have to feel that it's their baby, they have to feel it's their idea. So you so what you need to do is advise them in terms of these are your options. Mm. But it's your coach, mm. it's your team. You call your team what you want to call it, but you guys come up with it. I'm not gonna give your team a name like the boring database revision software team i think you should come up with a name like the angry tigers or something you know <laughs> oh, one of the best teams i worked with in government was were, were called the new model army you know that's what they call themselves they were a software team but they called themselves uh the new model army after all of the cromwell's guys you know uh, they, they had a flag those guys they're super i well. <laughs> love, that, love that team yeah um and surprise, surprise, the most productive team in the entire place, you know, because mm. they had that kind of culture, they had team games and all that kind of stuff, you know, and happy people, Henry Ford they knew this, happy people equals productive people. So often people said, how do we make our people more productive? Make them happy and people will naturally be productive. Human beings are naturally 
high flying self starters with great motivation. What stops them being that is bad management. And what I mean by bad management is command and control management, command and control style management, um, where the boss tells subordinates what to do. If you want to see if the, the culture in your organization is any good, just see how many times senior people tell junior people what to do, especially at a tactical level. It's okay with company-wide strategy, right? In a big organization, a few people at the top have to have a vision. Otherwise, nobody's going to be inspired, right? And they can communicate that vision. And that's what it's like the light that shines on the organization and people start pulling in that direction because of the great inspiration. Sebastian, case in point, yeah? And my teacher, case in point. But actually, most managers don't do that. They don't mm. do vision leadership they're not good at visionary leadership what they do instead is organizational leadership they do manipulative leadership they say i want you guys to do this we have decided that you guys will do this with this yeah um you want to kill productivity carry on like that mm. as a leader one of the things we should have mentioned probably is i've been a senior executive in my career as well so i've seen this from both sides i have been a bad senior executive early in my career as well um, and I went through that learning process of, you know, making all the mistakes. You know, if, if anybody wants a tip, if you're a senior leader and you want to see how it, to do it really, really badly, uh, there's a program on the TV at the moment. It's quite famous called The Apprentice. Um, just copy that. Copy that. And I'll bet you <laughs> if those guys, uh, Trump and Sugar, if they behave like that for real in their real businesses, they would have been out of business long mm. ago. They're putting it on for the cameras, and they're, they're, part of the problem is they're reinforcing public attitudes about what management looks like. And because, of, but certainly in this country, the majority of managers have never been trained in leadership. They've never been trained in management. They haven't got the foggiest clue how to do it. They just take the influences from movies like The Wolf of Wall Street and The Apprentice and all this kind of thing, and they think that's the norm. Yeah, the accepted status quo. One of the things I learned as a manager, I became a manager too early in life. I was very, very young. I was propelled into senior positions in quite big organizations way too early in life. Uh, one of the things that I learned is whatever way you want to do it, your gut reaction is almost certainly wrong. <laughs> almost <laughs> certainly wrong. Like everything in life, you have to learn it. There may be a few great natural leaders in life, but I've never met one of them. Most of the ones that I've learned that were what I would classify as great leaders became great leaders through their personal effort. They actively set out to become great leaders. In terms of what you actually do, and what I must say, because you're, you're, you are a very humble person, and just to let people know who are watching or, or listening to this, um, Damon has operated at a very, very high level in some very big businesses and organisations uh, where he's come in as a consultant and really shaking things up and if you're doing your job right correct me if i'm wrong often people dislike you at first uh, <laughs> but, but then end up loving you or maybe it's the right some people them. Do. some, some, some of them do. um yeah, but on. so what i was going to say though is from from a coaching perspective you are going in primarily um in terms of coaching a team or teams of individuals rather than one-on-one -on -one, right. or the How does it work? Is, we're talking about a senior leadership coaching here. Yeah? When you <laughs> when you do senior leadership coaching, you have a number of issues to deal with. You are rarely called in to a perfect situation. Mm -hmm. You're rarely called in to a wonderful organization that's having a great time. You know, for instance, um, at the time when John Ledger was CEO of T-Mobile and his staff were, were virtually worshipping the ground he walked on, and they all had a, felt a great inspiration in life, and they had this amazing guy who is basically the, one of the patron saints of Agile. Um, you know, not, not Agile process, because Agile isn't about process, Agile culture. He turned that organization around, and he made them all feel good about themselves, made them love what they were doing. Um, he wasn't going to call in any coach, any leadership consultant. He didn't need it, did he? Things mm. were good. Things were on the up. It's the, It tends to be organizations where there's a problem. Yeah. And in command and control organizations, the perception in very hierarchical organizations, the perception of where the problem lies is often not where the problem lies. Right. And so Taichi Ono had this after World War II. 
he had the backing of Yoshida Shigeru, the Japanese Prime Minister of the time, who was looking to use organizations like Toyota to revitalize the devastated Japanese economy of the ruin of losing the war. And they, the, Toyota were up against competitors from the side who'd won the war. It, it was Ford and General Motors. They'd just won the war. Japan had just lost. How can we compete against those guys effectively? Well, one thing we definitely can't do is twiddle around the edges with our processes. Yeah, We can't turn our people into better cogs in a machine. That's not going to work. We need a different approach. So rather than working on our processes, let's work instead on our culture and improve the culture of the organization and turn people into what my teacher calls spirited people. Yeah, Spirited teams was what he was always after. And so that, that idea where the organization ceases obsessing over processes, ceases obsessing over rules and regulations, and starts instead obsessing over its internal culture and actively taking control of that culture is the route to which, through which virtually all of those massively successful organizations have ended up where they are. Toyota is one case in point, SpaceX, Spotify, the list goes on and on. Um, Valve, let's mention Valve. I'd love to work for that company. The issue is that culture in a very hierarchical organization, an organization that's already hierarchical, already command and control, is used to senior people being involved in tactics, happens again and again and again. Tactics, according to Taiyuchi Ono, incidentally, Taiyuchi Ono was my teacher's direct teacher, so that's how I have this sort of relationship to him. Um, he, he saw that as a problem. And so what he was able to do was change the focus from where the problem wasn't, which was really on the production line, to where the problem was, which was leadership. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, the problem as an agile coach or as a leadership coach is that you're hired in to deal with the problem. And the perception within the organization, rightly or wrongly, is that the problem is with the teams. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I had this when I first started off as a coach all those years ago. It's a long time. We do this over 20 years now, you know. Um, all those years ago, I get called in, have a look at the team, see what the problem is. What's the problem with the workflow? Re-engineer the processes. Tell them what to do. And you look at the teams and then maybe there's one or two things they can you know, improve on. you know. But then it gradually dawns on you. I remember my very first consulting contract. It gradually dawns on you. The problem is not the team. The problem is the guy who's just hired me. Yeah. <laughs> How do I deal with this situation? It's such a difficult position to be in because the perception of the person where the problem lies, it's a leadership problem, is that the problem is with the team, not with them. The leader typically hasn't had any leadership training and has never actually has got into their position through circumstance, through happenstance. Maybe somebody liked them, somebody senior liked them and promoted them, you know, that kind of like hires like thing. Mm-hmm. But they didn't become a leader because they wanted to lead. They didn't wake up one day and say, I want to learn how to lead people really well. That never happened. They actually have no interest in leadership, a lot of them. Not all of them, but a lot of them have no interest. And even if they do, they have no outlet to pursue that. Yeah. I think the situation is slightly less bad in the States. I worked in New York years ago, and I found the leadership culture of the States to be merely bad, whereas the UK is really dreadful. So the States has one up on us as far as that goes. Um, but the in general, I mean, there's exceptions, of course. But it's very, very easy as a leader, if you're a leader in an organization, it's very, very easy to tell whether you've got it, you, you have developed yourself and your colleagues, your colleagues, what I mean is the rest of the senior leadership team. When they see you, do your colleagues, your juniors, do they light up like a torch? Do they beam from ear to ear when they see you? If they don't, you've got a problem mm. because people like to see somebody they don't see very often. But that's a di- again, another difference with the culture. Another question you can ask yourself whether the organization is any good is, how long ago did you have a chat with the CEO? Yeah, so, you know, my teacher, thousands and thousands of people working under him. Most of, vast majority of those people could say within the last week mm-hmm. or two weeks, yeah. Um, yeah. John Ledger, T-Mobile USA, ringing up customers, massive multi-billion dollar organization. He's ringing up customers to deal with their issues personally from mm-hmm. his CEO office. You know, mm-hmm. that's a great leader. You know, mm-hmm. 
uh, because he cares about what people think of the organization. And if there's a tricky problem that the call center or whoever can't handle, he'll deal with it. He's quite happy to ring customers up. Now, I contrast that with what I've seen in some institutions where not only do customers not hear from the CEO of the organization, but very often the staff don't either, you know, Mm -hmm. one particular government department. I won't mention it. I worked in there for over two years and I never met the CEO. And it wasn't like I was in a small branch office. I was in the main office. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. You're talking about a situation where you've been contracted to come in, shake things up, make a difference. And that's based upon a perception by those that are hiring you that it's one thing, namely probably the workforce. Process, because that's what they understand. The process. Okay. So the thinking process. You come in, do that, and then you find out what you expect or have learned to expect that actually it's it's culture. it's actually culture that needs changing and dealing yeah. with but that perhaps is going to be well is here's probably the problem be, with that here's how do you go about that well here's the problem let me explain the problem before you talked about the, the 20 years of pain i went through to figure <laughs> out how to go about that here here is the issue one of the reasons why in these unhealthy organizations they talk about process all the time is, and they think the solutions, pro, it's like the solutions change our processes. What's the question? I said this to some senior people in a, didn't go down too well. I said, look, you guys have been changing your processes for 20 years or 30 years or 50 years, and you're no more productive now than you were when you started, despite all that constant change of your processes. You know, The issue is that they talk about things outside of themselves because they're in an environment and they're in a, what I call a cold environment. They're not in a warm, nurturing environment. They're in a cold environment. And they're always worried. They're always looking over their shoulder in a cold environment. What if I'm not needed? What if I'm part of the 2% or 40% of cuts that are coming down the line? I must protect myself. Uh, what, how do I make this particular leader who's well-placed like me uh, and show that I dislike that other leader who they don't like so that they'll promote me, this kind of stuff. All those kind of issues that you get in cold environments, they put a suit of spiritual armor over themselves, they hide their heart, and they do what they think is the best behavior they can do in order not to get themselves in trouble. And it tends to be that way. It tends to be what's not going to get me in trouble, right. not what's the best thing to do for the organization. Um, and often in these organizations, those two things are in conflict with each other, which is why organizations that talk about innovation all the time, we inno- we were, our, our value is to innovate. We innovate and they don't innovate. Yeah, They don't innovate because human beings are naturally innovative unless they exist within a fear culture and they're frightened to change anything Yeah, in case they get in trouble. Yeah, How are people going to innovate within a fear culture? The issue with culture is when you start to talk about it, and have I ever upset some very senior people talking about it? <laughs> culture is not something outside of you. It's part of who I am. My culture is part of who I am. It's something I identify as. You start criticizing my culture. You are criticizing me personally. You're not criticizing some workflow that's outside of me. You're criticizing my behavior. And this is exactly what Tai Chono did. He came down on the senior leadership of Toyota like a ton of bricks. And he totally flipped it previously during, you know, the World War II, you know, screaming orders in your subordinate's face and they just kowtow type of culture, which is what Toyota had before him. It was it was like subordinates probably not even allowed to speak, let alone anything else, you know. And he said, right, we're going to turn this on the head. We're going to be really nice to our staff. Yeah. Our, our production line staff. Those are the guys who do the work. Those are the buyers who bring in the work. Uh, you know, the franchise dealerships and all that kind of stuff. Those are the guys who bring them up. We're going to be really nice to those guys. Who are we going to put the pressure on? Who are we going to make come up to the mark first? It's our senior leadership. And one of the things he put a stop to super fast was what I call ivory towers meetings. That's where a bunch of seniors get together in an office and without any information coming in from the outside, they make a bunch of decisions that then some other person sends off and delivers to the troops. Yeah. Not only that, when they do want some information, which isn't very often because they, in these organizations, they all tend to be dead opinionated on the basis of nothing other than their opinion. They have to have somebody else to bring a message of what's called a report to them from the troops. Then they read the report, maybe, or maybe they can't be bothered because they're so important. And then they make their decisions based on this report. But the problem is that person who's bringing the report is in a fear culture. They're terrified of telling them the truth. 
So they massage the report so that it's not representative of what's going on. And this is why this sort of vicious cycle perpetuates itself, because ultimately agile is personal development. What kind of personal development? It's everybody's personal development, because in an agile organization, everybody's a leader. But in a command and control organization, everybody isn't a leader. We call it the rain dance organization. You know, they're, they're fiddling around with the dance all the time, but it doesn't make it rain. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the problem in a command and control, the, the, the biggest part, this is like the 80-20 rule, 80% of the problem in a non-agile organization lies with the senior leadership. 20% lies with the rest of the organization. So where do you start? You start with the 80% of the problem because it's not 80% of the Eighty percent of the problem is with twenty percent of the people, yeah. but that's not where they start. They start grassroots, and that's why it fails. And you get what's called agile or fragile, fake agile. You know, where they they, they dress up, mm. they're like dressing up as soldiers. They're marching up and down the square. They put their uniforms on, and they polish their guns and stuff, but they haven't got a clue how to fight. Um, they're not soldiers, they're pretending to be soldiers. And that's what happens in these command control organizations where the junior level of the organization goes agile as a test, in inverted commas. Let's test it with those junior teams, see if this agile process methodology works. And if it does, we'll be convinced to try it with a few more junior teams. Yeah, But the com- that completely misses the point because agile is not about the processes that junior teams use in a command and control organization. It's about the behaviors that senior leaders exhibit in a command and control organization in order to command and control not the processes and the tactics, but the culture of that mm-hmm. organization into a more healthy place. And in a command and control organization, in a hierarchical organization, Only the seniors can do that. The juniors are not able, they're not empowered. And you hear this all the time in painful attempted agile implementations where only juniors are involved. Mm -hmm. We're not allowed. We can't do that. We have to muck around with the process. Product owners can't really be product owners. Scrum masters can't really be scrum masters. Team members can't really be team members. You know, all this kind of stuff because our seniors who aren't agile won't allow us to. Yeah. And so this is why I've always focused on the seniors, to my detriment in many cases. How do you start persuading them? Number one tip for anybody who aspires to go into agile leadership consulting, never, ever make the mistake of addressing them as a group. Don't get the company bought together and start telling them what they've been doing wrong. Don't do it. You must do it on an individual basis. You have to get them one-to-one, and that's very, very difficult because these people are also so busy despite not doing any work all day. They're all so busy. Their schedule is jammed. And how did they get in those positions? How were they promoted? One of the reasons they were promoted is they made themselves look really busy. Oh, I'm stretched. I haven't got time to do that because I've got this and all this kind of stuff. And you look at the calendars and every little second is jammed out. Whole week is blocked out with endless meetings, productivity at the end of the week virtually nil it's those behaviors that need to change it's those leadership behaviors it's not that there aren't other things that the organization needs to change that it's leadership culture but none of those other things ever will change unless the leadership cha- culture changes first and that's why that's where you have to start you do it on an individual basis and one of the ways to do it is just like i was talking about before the work like balance stuff mm-hmm. What a lot of these seniors have been promoted, you know, those those Rendance cultures that tend to be fairly self-centered sort of cultures, you know, selfishness pays in a lot of those cultures. I'm not saying no, there's a spectrum, isn't there? I'm just, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. I've just been called into the worst sometimes, you know, um, because that's where there's the most need, right? That's why, you know, this hugely important project is failing. Which is why we're not mentioning names, right? Yeah, absolutely not mentioning yeah. names. I did mention government though, because not all government, not all government. I will mention names when government departments do well. So, for mm-hmm. instance, the, Her Majesty's Land Registry in the UK. What a great government department! I love those guys. Yeah. Uh, anybody wants to work at the Land Registry, one of my recommendations. I love those guys. Yeah. It's about personal development, but the bang for buck, and it is for everybody. It's about how do I make myself a more vibrant human being. In the context of the work that I do, in the context of the life that I lead, in terms of the people in a hierarchical organization that's large, the vast majority of the benefit of that organization, people personally developing themselves to be more vibrant human beings, unfortunately, the vast majority, because of the hierarchy, 
vast majority of the benefit will come from the tiny minority right at the very top of the organization. Um, leadership is everything, everything in agile organizations. Um, and like I say, organizations that already are agile, they have a very healthy leadership culture and therefore everybody is leader to a certain mm-hmm. extent in those organizations. Great example would be the special forces uh, down here, the, the special SPS, special boat service who are based down here near where I live, I live in Cornwall, incidentally, and quite near Plymouth. Um, those guys have a super healthy leadership culture and everybody is a leader. Even the most junior person in the organization is a leader um, because leadership means a different thing to them to what it means in these sort of hierarchical organizations. Ultimately, personal development. What is the personal development towards? The personal development towards is how do I change myself in order to help other people create a win-win situation for everybody? In order to impact culture, it comes down to those one-to-one conversations where you, you can have, have so careful, mate. And unfortunately, you also have to tailor it to the individual. That's why I say get them separately. One of the things that a lot of people don't know in these unhealthy sort of hierarchical organizations is the senior leadership teams tend to not trust each other. Mm. And they won't talk openly when the others are there. Um, so that's that's no way to lead an organization, is it? You know, I would con- I would like to contrast that with the senior leadership of the most agile organization, team of the most agile organization I ever worked in, uh, who used to shout and scream at each other in public, <laughs> throw things at each other and all sorts of stuff, you know, and have a lot of fun together. And there was never, for instance, there was never a board, I was a member of this team, there was never a board meeting that went past mm. Immediately go and explain everything that we'd gone through to the organization in detail, not keeping any dirty washing, you know, mm. hidden or anything like that. And, and do it spontaneously. Never ever did we vet what came out of our mouths through some sort of internal comms department because there wasn't one, you know. Um, I remember I did a, I did a, um, I won't say who for, not not a government department, uh, an institution. Um, and I did a, a introductory video about Agile. It was about 25 minutes long. And it went, it had to go to the comms department. And it ended up being five minutes long. The amount of stuff that got sent, the 20 minutes worth of censorship applied to it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's particularly, that's, uh, that particular organization is the worst place that I've ever worked in my life. In the the agile world that you you've worked in, as it were, there has been a culture of trust because people can say what they really think. Whereas in 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 other situations they haven't, which is why your coaching sessions are so powerful because they are confidential and it at least gives people an opportunity to share, say and share what they think. But it's how do you go from a place where you've got lots of individuals telling you the truth and and saying how they really feel but can't corporately how do you go from that to let's be honest and and create a culture where we can see see one another's true feelings and use that to grow how do you develop that it has to come from the ceo ceo gets up in front of his people and says i'm not happy with the way we've been living our lives i trust you guys i'm i'm going to work with the rest of my senior leadership team and what we're going to do is we're going to try to devolve as much decision making about what's important what's tactically important in our organization to you guys as we possibly can we're going to stop making those decisions for you because you guys are awesome we trust you implicitly mm-hmm. what we're going to do instead is spend our time more on what we should have been doing all along which is coming up with a great vision for organization that inspires not just you guys, but our customers as well. Mm. That makes them feel good about them, makes them want to get up in the morning, you know, and have a happy day, you know. Mm. We're going to paint a picture. We're going to work hard together, create a picture of an emerald city out there in the future. But we are absolutely not going to tell you guys how to do what you know better how to do than we do, which is how to build the yellow brick road in order to get us there. That's for you guys. And you're going to lead us in terms of the tactics. So we're going to, instead of having a st- strategic leadership down the organization and tactics down the organization from top to bottom, we're going to reverse the direction of tactical leadership. We're going to work hard on the strategy. We're going to paint that inspiring vision. Maybe in this, when you do this presentation, it's good to have a bit of that vision to show them so you can see that you're serious about it. Um, and, and you guys... You're going to tell us how that's going to be done. Yeah, mm. that's that's the way it's going to work from now on. Yeah, 
We yeah. trust you. Mm-hmm. John Ledger, great quote from John Ledger. He's talking to his frontline staff, right? As I said, multi-billion dollar organization, T-Mobile USA. Everybody between me and you is the enemy. That's the CEO. Uh, and what he meant by that was that any kind of hierarchy where anybody is superior to somebody junior, that's the enemy. The, the enemy is not the person, it, the, the actual physical people. It's the culture, the, the negative mm. rain culture that's embedded within them, in their hearts. Mm. That's what the problem is. And, and when people leave that culture in the middle of the organization, they join the me and you, yeah? Mm. And, and so there's only us. There's not us and them. And the, mm. that, you know, you hear seniors talking about their juniors as them. Them? Mm. You're mm. responsible for them. Mm. You are their captain. You are their, you know, you are them. I, I, I've, I've seen it so many times, you know, a leader says, I told them what to do and they didn't follow through. I thought, that's your teammate. That's you. That's your team. You're the captain of that team. Yeah. You told them what to do. It was <laughs> your job to get it done. You're responsible for it and you're responsible for them. Mm. You know. And this is what Taichi Ono did at Toyota. He turned the leadership culture on its head. He dragged them out of those, supposedly, legend has it, literally by pulling them by the collar. Dragged them out of those ivory tower meetings, stood them next to the teams, and then there's the famous chalk circles that used to drown, draw around their feet to make them stay there. So wow. if you step out of that circle, you've got me to, to reckon with. you know. So this senior leader is talking to their teams became bedded in that organization's culture. Not to say that Toyota haven't taken a few steps back since Ono left. But um, but they got to a quite healthy place with it. You think about it, Japanese Japanese company in the 1950s, 1960s, you join a Japanese company where you're used to the hairdryer treatment. You know, your leaders scream orders into your face, blowing your hair back simultaneously. You know, that's what you're used to. That's what you think leadership is about. That's what you think society and business is about. And then all of a sudden you join an organization where your leader is not allowed to discipline you. It's like, mm-hmm. what? What? <laughs> it must be like going to Mars, you know? I was talking to a guy who served in the SCS for seven years, I think. And I think what really struck me is the similarity between the leadership style, between what he went through and indeed trained other people from all over the world in, was that it was very similar to what you've just described in terms of agile way of working within business or anywhere else. It's a lot of agility in military. Um, they have to be, because if they're not, they die. But there is an actual link between Agile and um, a lot of those sort of special forces, people like the SES, um, which is that uh, people like Grace Hopper, Admiral, Rear Admiral Grace Hopper, in the States uh, started to apply this kind of way of thinking. She knew about the stuff Taiji Ono had done, and she started to apply this kind of uh, thinking with her own people, and her ideas kind of percolated out into other areas not the least of which was the Navy SEALs, which are like the US equivalent of the SAS and SBS. SBS, I guess, would be the equivalent of. Uh, and so, but the, the, the point with those guys, is just like martial arts, isn't it? You don't have a choice. You're either agile or you die, yeah? The problem with these command and control organizations, these redundancy organizations, is they create fuzzy edges on everything, yeah? It's not immediately apparent whether something is effective or not. Uh, and the way that they measure things, time is money. They measure productivity in terms of, you know, how much time has been spent, how many how many hours have been booked against different cost codes in our in our cost code database. That's not productivity. That's no kind of measure of productivity. A measure of productivity is, for instance, for a subscription, what's our customer renewal rate? Is it higher than 99.98%? If not, it's not acceptable, you know? Mm. Um mm. That, that's a great measure of productivity because that includes your customers. It includes your people. I'll tell you now, you won't have a 99.98% renewal rate if your staff aren't happy. That's not going to happen because mm. your staff are the ones talking to your customers, right? Yeah. 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 So so I'm, I'm using 99.98 because that organization that I worked for that was the most agile one I ever worked for in my life, they did have that kind of renewal rate mm-hmm. on all their subscription services. But the customers, I mean, they picked up a massive Chinese company, Sinopec, the first Western supplier. And I'm convinced 
they're a massive Chinese oil company. I'm convinced they picked up that company because that company picked up on the good feeling that was going on in the organization. Mm-hmm. There mm-hmm. was no massive spreadsheet analysis of whether, you know, this particular company is, has mm-hmm. ticked all the boxes. Have they got their ISO 9000s and stuff? I'm sure they want to know that stuff. But, you know, it wasn't. They picked up on the buzz. They had, mm-hmm. felt like stuff was happening in there all the time. They picked up on it and they, they took us on as their first ever Western supplier, Chinese oil giant. You know. There is absolutely loads of stuff that you could be sharing stories. And, and you know, I know from previous conversations and I've had, as you say, I've had the privilege to work with you. We're just scratching the, the surface, really. But before we, we wrap up, your proudest achievement? Oh, my family. I love mm. my family. I'm very, very happy in my family. Um, a particular lady that I married was somebody who I desperately wanted to 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 marry to create to make a family with um not sure so sure she was so keen on me when we started off um but so, so my family is my, my greatest achievement but also my students I've, like i said i've mentioned you know i was a student who was european champion in martial arts and i had um several actually people who were down on the look especially people who are long-term unemployed who i mean one of them uh I hired and now he's the leading technologist in a in a cutting edge organization um, having had no experience of anything really in life uh, mm-hmm. and being very timid and shy and now he's a great life, great family, lovely family mm-hmm. um, and, and just doing really well in life. Agile can help you way outside the workplace, man. I'll mm-hmm. tell you that's one thing. I, I've I also privileged to have worked with you, Mark. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's been a great, uh, great and interesting interaction. And, you. you know, also, you know, some of the people that, like yourself, who I've met in the various different bits of work that I've done, and we, we strike up these kind of friendships um, and, and that are kind of vibrant and we can do things like this. Um, that great achievement in my life, uh, one of the things that I know will be my greatest achievement is when I'm on my deathbed, uh, that I know already I'll be lying there with no regrets, none whatsoever. Um, I've done the traveling I want to do, but I've traveled the world. Uh, I've, I've seen a lot of the things I want to see, you know, those kind of things that I wanted to do. I so desperately wanted a black belt when I was a kid. Um, but, you know, that that's done long ago, you know. And it's no, no, to be honest, if I didn't have a black belt now, I, it wouldn't be any kind of a motivator for me. It's funny how your perception of things change. Mm-hmm. And fundamentally, my shamanism want to know what's going on underneath the metaphorical bonnet of nature. And I've had a privilege in my life to have some contact with this kind of understanding. And again, that's a great achievement for me. That was also the joy of martial arts for me. I love martial arts. I've been able to study a significant number of martial arts to quite an advanced level, more than 10. And if you can think of the 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 things that I've done, like people making teams more productive, helping people to come together in win-win situations within the workplace to create a warm and loving and welcoming environment within the, the workplace where people that genuinely care about each other and look out for each other and got each other's back. That's human beings coming together in productive relationships. Mm-hmm. Martial arts is the other end of the spectrum. That's how do you deal with human beings in conflict? The conflict has got to such a bad extent that somebody tries to kill you. How do you stop them? Yeah. Mm. But those I see as two different sides of the same coin. So another joy that I've had is to be able to look at this issue of human interactions from those two different, very different, seemingly different standpoints. But the lessons that you draw, the life lessons that you draw from looking from those very, very different vantage points are the self-same lessons. That's really interesting to me. Mm. Uh, That's another great, great achievement for my life. Wow. So um, if I was to ask you, who was the person you most admired? Oh, my goodness, you, there's a ton of them. There's an yeah. absolute ton of them. If you had to drill it down to, to one Gandhi, or indeed. I have to be Gandhi. Um, there are others. Um, maybe some people that a lot of people haven't heard of. Christian Rosenkreutz mm-hmm. has been a huge influence on my life. And uh, my teacher, Kato Sensei, and my mm-hmm. wife. Um, and various other people. There's a ton of people I admire, yourself included, Mark. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> That's a privilege. And so if there was one film... Ben-Hur. What film? That's an easy one. 
Ben Hur. Oh, really? Why, why Ben Hur? Ben Hur does the 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 Christian thing very subtly. But the thing <laughs> with Charlton Heston's portrayal of that character is that it's in a way the kind of Christianity that he's portraying through that character is social Christianity. It's culture Christianity. It's We've been brought up in this command and control culture, the Roman Empire, mm. and we've been taught to respect these hierarchies and stuff. But there is another way to happiness. It's not all about wealth. It's not all about possessions. It's not all about working hard and following orders mindlessly. Sometimes it's about love thy neighbor. It's about turning the other cheek. It's about taking uh the other person into account in your decision making um, and in how you how you move forwards in your life. And that is uh, the aspect of Christianity that, that I love, that I'm interested in. The, I'm not a Christian, incidentally. I'm just telling you what I like about Christianity. I uh, <laughs> think that that doesn't mean that I don't think there's no value in it. Mm-hmm. I see in the Bible, for instance, I see a bunch of different things. I see the sort of Old Testament eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And mm. to me, for me, if you wanted a Christianity that I'm going to believe in, just cut out the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> That's it. I need a very, very thin Bible. I guess it's a distillation of key points. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, look, thank you very much for your your, your time um, with us. Really appreciate that. And um, we'll hopefully have you along again, again sometime. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And thanks to everyone for listening. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the podcast. Until next time, remember, help people feel valued. Listen, don't just hear.